Let's get this sports podcast party started, all right? The J Reels Podcast. What is happening to my good people? Greetings. How are you? How's it going? How's everybody doing out there? What is the latest and greatest? Hope everybody's doing well, feeling fantastic, in excellent spirits, pumped up and ready to go for another exciting week of content to produce and release as I set the stage for what's took place and what to expect in the world of sports as this is the J Reels Podcast with your host J Reels. For my first timers, welcome aboard. And for those who have been banging with me going back to the very beginning, somewhere in the middle or even as early as this past Thursday, I welcome you guys and gals back. And yes, it's going to be an exciting week with a lot going on. And let me get to some quick housekeeping notes to begin. If you're watching on YouTube at J Reels, you see me wearing a shirt that says, I am new media. Well, yesterday I finally released a vlog detailing just that. My journey throughout this medium, whether it be here on this podcast or even prior to that, internet radio, AM radio, community radio, you name it, I've pretty much not necessarily done it all, but I've done quite a bit. And of course, with yours truly being the new media, compared to the old media, how we're accepted when it comes to them versus us, and even with the new media today, there's a few people I even have to shout out when it comes to integrity, when it comes to having this type of platform. So yes, yours truly breaks it all out 24 minutes i would love to get your thoughts please subscribe like leave a comment again on my youtube channel at j reels just released yesterday so you definitely want to peep that and i'll be more than happy to hear whatever input feedback constructive criticism you name it as that is on the channel and then come wednesday i have a very special guest Casey Standahar from Fox Sports, ESPN, the Big East Network, Sideline Reporter. Her journey in her broadcasting and reporting career has been unlike any other. And yes, although she has gone to school, and yes, she has gone the semi-traditional way, but she certainly has not carved her path in the most traditional fashion, or even conventional fashion for that matter. And it's somewhat similar to what I've been doing throughout the course of the last few years, so you definitely want to hear her story A lot of interesting tidbits, talks a lot about baseball, believe it or not. That's where her first love is, where my first love is as well. So we'll get into that. We'll get into a bunch of other different things in regards to her career path and what she's done. And it's just a great story and certainly a very good conversation that is on deck coming Wednesday. And not only that, I'll have it on Apple, Spotify, on the website, jreels.com, as well as where else? YouTube, at J Reels, as I recorded that on video, so you definitely don't want to miss that, and that'll be up on Wednesday, so stay tuned for that. Now that I got that out of the way, let's get into some sports, and we all know that the finals are in full gear, in particular the NBA, and that's where I'm going to start, because we're already two games in, where the Stanley Cup final will have game two, over and out by, I would say, 11 p.m. tonight, Eastern time, unless it happens to go into overtime, but with the association... And I'm sure a lot of people are looking at the series as a foregone conclusion that the Celtics will end up being NBA champions. And for yours truly, the Celtic fan that I am, yes, I could count my chickens before they hatch and look at it like, are they going to lose the next four or five games in this series in order for the Mavericks to become world champs? Chances are that's not going to be the case, but we have to take one game at a time. As I've said all along, and maybe with the way they performed this year, think about it. They're 14-2 and in this postseason, already up two games in the series. And I'll even go back to Thursday night from when we last spoke to preview the series. Chris Stapps Porzingis, that was not to say the Porzingis game, but it was certainly the first half because he came out guns a-blazing, the biggest game of his career, the deepest that he's ever gone into an NBA postseason And I understand he didn't play in the conference semis or even in the conference final, but shooting threes, making plays, blocking shots, just an unbelievable first half to where the Celtics jumped out to a 29-point lead, their biggest lead in the game. And it looked like it was going to be smooth sailing from then on out. But toward the end of the first half and even deep into the second half, deep into the third quarter, I should say, that's when Luka finally, the switch turned on and he was able to run a big-time lead that was 29, cut it to 8, where it was all Luka. Kyrie did not have a big game, 6 for 19, only had 12 points in the game. And at 72-64, after the coach, Joe Mazzulla, the Celtics, called a timeout, 
Then they proceeded to go on a 14-0 run. Jalen Brown was magnificent defensively. Celtics, again, draining threes left and right, had 16 in the game, and then went going away to where the Celtics held the Dallas Mavericks to under 90 points. They win 107-89 and cap off a game one with an excellent defensive performance with a bunch of threes. The formula for the Celtics pretty much all year when it comes to them winning ball games. And then last night, you had a scenario where the Celtics did not shoot well from three. They actually got a bunch of free throws, actually hit, I believe, 16 of their first 16, which made up for them not being able to shoot well from behind the three-point line. And for the Mavericks, who played smart, they played tough, and were in the game. They were down by three at the half. Luka did whatever he could on the court, as we've seen time after time after time. Had 23 points in the first half, making all types of shots. But then the Celtics made adjustments defensively. And when you look at how they were able to stymie Luka, force him into some turnovers. But at the same time, I was a little bit surprised by Luka not taking more shots. Because considering that he ended up with 32 in the game, had a triple-double. And even for Luka in game one, he did not have a good game. And I don't care what people say. I understand he had 30 points and about 10 rebounds. He only had one assist. And for Luka to get one assist in any ball game, that just goes to show you that for he, as great and as brilliant as he is as a player, that was a bad game for him. But then last night did have a triple-double, but certainly was a little bit more conservative. Granted that the Celtic defense did ratchet it up there a little bit when it comes to number 77. And then to think that he only scored nine points in the second half and Kyrie was another no-show, 7 for 18, 0 for 8 from 3 in this series. Again, a bunch of defensive assignments where it's either Drew Holiday, Derek White, sometimes you even had Jason Tatum on him, sometimes even Al Horford. It was amazing to think how they were able to just put Kyrie pretty much in a box, not get him loose. And yes, he is Kyrie. He's going to make his shots where they're going to the basket or that mid-range game that he has, but from behind the arc, has not shot well, and certainly has frustrated him throughout the course of these first two games. And that's pretty much a preview, or I should say a review, excuse me, of what has taken place throughout the first two games. Defensively, the Celtics have been phenomenal, led by Jalen Brown, as well as Kristaps Porzingis. You had the big block there late in the game where the Celtics were up by five, and it looked like the Mavericks going to cut it to two, where P.J. Washington, who did walk, I'm sorry, he took one step after he got the pass and then took two more steps before his shot was blocked there by Derek White. I know a lot of people thought that could have been a foul, but that wasn't going to be called at that point. And even Jalen Brown was there as a reinforcement to be able to block that shot from P.J. Washington. But here's what you need to know about the series in a maybe not so big nutshell. But in these first two games, Luka was good, not great. Kyrie was awful, and the supporting cast for the Dallas Mavericks was a no-show. P.J. Washington, I get it, he got his points here and there, but certainly wasn't a steady force to be able to have that third option or even to withstand what Kyrie was not able to do offensively. And for he, P.J. Washington, or Derek Jones Jr., now the Daniel Gaffords and the Derek Lively's of the world, they're not going to fill up the stat sheet when it comes to points. They're going to get rebounds, they're going to get blocks, and this is the problem of the Mavericks, and I talked about it the other day, if Kyrie and Luka aren't going to get anywhere between 60 to 70 points, where are you going to get the 35 to 40 points that you would think, if you're the Mavericks, that you're going to be able to put yourselves in a position to win games? And as we've saw, seen here in these first two games, they have done nothing. He even had Tim Hardaway that had to dust him off toward the end of game one, and he only got in for three minutes. And you got to wonder what's going on with him, where he's a guy that could put the ball in the basket and is able to score in this league, but I don't know if he's nursing an injury. I don't know what's going on with him. And even with Luka, I know that his status was questionable for yesterday's game, and you knew that he was not going to, unless his leg was cut off, you knew that he was going to be in that starting lineup and be on the floor for game two. But the Mavericks, they have no answers for the Celtics, whether it's offensively, defensively. And now they go back home hoping that their supporting cast in the friendly confines will be able to step it up, at least for a game three. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But that's what you have on the Mavericks side. 
But for the Celtics, they have played like a complete team, whether it's Jalen Brown putting in points, but at the same time playing defensively like a madman, as well as Drew Holiday yesterday, 26 points in the game, which, again, balanced out for what Jason Tatum didn't do in the game. And Tatum in these first two games, as far as him offensively, when it comes to taking shots, making shots, he has been brutal. And I know even Kendrick Perkins made a statement about Jason Tatum. It doesn't matter. If they're winning the games, even if Tatum goes 3 for 20, but if the Celtics win by one, you're not going to concern yourself about Tatum and why he's going through some offensive woes when it comes to shooting. Because as we all know, he's had his struggles throughout this postseason. Now, granted, in the Indiana series, he did step up, take some big shots, make some plays. But overall, throughout the course of these three and a half series, he has not been the Jason Tatum that we've seen in the past. But guess what? They don't even need him in that regard because you have Drew Holiday picking up the slack. Derek White has made some big shots. Porzingis obviously has played and did not have a bigger effect offensively in game two than he had in game one. But this is the definition of a team. And when you have guys that have been able to step up and pick up the slack, and especially Drew Holiday, not only defensively as we've seen, but offensively with the 26 points, a lot of great plays by Tatum. And that's the other thing that kind of gets unnoticed. Tatum has had a bunch of assists. And I believe he was one rebound short of a triple-double yesterday, but he's been finding the open man. And the big thing about this Celtic team that we've seen and haven't really seen throughout the course of this run is that the Celtics have been a little bit more controlled when it comes to bringing the ball up. Celtics, as we've seen down the stretch, especially when it's in crunch time, turning the ball over, sloppy play. We've seen that. A smattering of times, but certainly not the runs to the finals two years ago or even last year when they got to a Game 7 against Miami. The Tatum-Brown, they've been able to dodge their way through traffic, been able to get the ball, kick it out, or get it into the paint to other people and have been able to go up for layups or dunks. And that's what we've seen here with the Celtics in these first two games as, again, cohesive, and certainly knowing that the big picture, the task at hand is to win a title. It's not about playing hero ball, which you haven't seen from the guys. Or it's not about having to get their shots or get their points. I'm sure Tatum, Brown, etc. They're just content knowing that they're contributing in other ways and putting forth an effort to know that it's all about getting that banner to the rafters come the middle or latter part of October and winning the brass ring. It's not about trying to get their points. It's not about trying to get MVPs. It's not about trying to play hero ball, as I mentioned. It's just about getting the task and the job at hand is just winning the game. And the Celtics are doing that. And that's pretty much been the first two games. I don't know what else to add besides that because other than Porzingis, well, let's see what's going to happen with him for game three. He says that he's going to have to die out in the court in order for him to have to be removed. He came up lame there in the fourth quarter when he fell behind the basket. And even though it didn't look as bad as it did down in Miami when he pulled that calf muscle and was out for 38 days. But Porzingis, I'm sure they're going to monitor that. Who knows what his minutes are going to be like. Does that mean Al Horford, does his minutes spike up to substitute for Porzingis? Maybe not playing as much as he did in the first two games. That we'll have to wait and see, but hopefully it's not hubris on his part. I understand that he wants to be out there. He knows that these are the biggest games of his career, and he wants to contribute in any way that he possibly can. But hopefully it's a situation where he'll be able to get a lot of treatment over the next few days. I'm sure they're probably flying to Dallas as I speak. And therefore, the Celtics right now are just riding high. And like I mentioned, with the Celtics, there isn't anything else that I could even chime in or chip in you know Al Horford he's going to do what he does more so defensively than offensively he made that one three there toward the end of the first quarter which kind of continued a meaningless streak of three pointers made at least in every quarter in the playoffs or whatever it was but for the Celtics they're two wins away I would think they'll get one of these next two they have not lost on the road so far in this postseason and what it boils down to is this the Mavericks must win Game 3 because you would think if they lose Game 3, the Celtics are going to smell blood and they're going to want to sweep this series and cap off a 16-2 postseason. Now, if they do that, does that mean they're going to be up in the annals of one of the all-time great NBA teams? I'm not going to say that. I mean, please. The 2008 Celtic team that won the title, 
They were 66 and 16. So they had two more games better than them in the standings in the regular season. And remember, they went the distance in the first round against Atlanta and in the second round against Cleveland before winning in six against Detroit and then, of course, the Lakers there. So you want to say a better postseason run if they do happen to run the table the rest of the way than the previous championship winner 16 years ago? I guess you could argue that. And then the irony of that would be, now mind you, if the Celtics go to a fifth game, which would be next Monday, so if they split down there and a week from today we're talking about those two games, Wednesday and Friday down in Dallas, to the point where they're up 3-1 and they could ice the championship later that evening, that will actually be on the anniversary of when they won their last championship, which was June 17th, 2008. So just keep that in the back of your mind as a receipt there if we do get to next Monday where the Celtics are up 3-1. But again, let's go back to now Wednesday because obviously when we reconvene on Thursday, there's only one game to discuss. The Mavericks, obviously they're going to have to throw the kitchen sink. And even though, as I mentioned, the Celtics played Luka very well in that second half, bottled them up, forced them into turnovers, but he's going to have to take in upwards of 30 shots if they're going to win this game. And I'm not going to even say the series, but if the Mavericks are going to jump back in the series, obviously they need to have a better offensive performance from Kyrie Irving. They're going to need to have a third guy, whether it is P.J. Washington, Derek Jones Jr. I don't expect Daniel Gafford or even Derek Lively to step up there offensively because one thing that we've seen throughout the course of the postseason and we have not really seen in this series, other than maybe a couple Last night, and maybe one or two in game one, you haven't seen the alley-oops. You haven't seen the flush from whether it be Luka or Kyrie. The Celtics have patrolled the front of the rim, and they've been able to thwart the alley-oops and a lot of easy baskets from the bigs, or for the bigs, I should say. So unless they go off and get those type of points there in game three, and Luka's not going to put up 45, and Kyrie's not going to put up, let's say, even 25 to 35, then it looks like the Celtics could have another win, and we'll go for the dagger there Friday night to see whether or not they'll be champions or have to come back there on Monday, as I mentioned just a little while ago. So that's pretty much the series. I don't know what else to say. I think the Mavericks will definitely show up. I know the crowd will be behind them. I'm sure Luka is going to have the FU gene, which he always has, but knowing they're at home and knowing that they can't go out like that. But I truly believe if the Mavericks aren't going to win game three, I think it's going to be a sweep. Because the Celtics at that point, they're not going to mess around. They're not going to fool around. Now, I'm not going to guarantee that they're going to sweep. But I would think that they would look at it from a standpoint of they are almost lifeless. They do have a pulse because they will will have one more game to fight for their season. But I would think the Celtics are going to go all out to just try to put the stake through the Mavericks' heart if they're up 3-0. And as we've seen here throughout the postseason, the Celtics have not lost on the road. Now, of course, are they due to lose on the road? Absolutely. Will it be Game 3? I don't know. But based on everything you've seen, read, and even heard by the players, knowing that after Game 1, they said, hey, we won Game 1 in the 2022 Finals on the road at Golden State. And what happened? The rest of that series. And then they won game one, as we know, there on Thursday night. Followed that up with a win there last night. And I'm sure they're thinking of this as, wait, we're down 0-2 going to Dallas. We're going to play desperate. We're going to play as if we're gasping for air. And when they have that type of attitude and have that demeanor, that's going to be tough sledding for the Mavericks. So we'll wait and see what's going to happen there come Wednesday night. And obviously we'll talk about it on Thursday's pod. Now, a couple other things in the NBA. Today, there should be a decision on Danny Hurley, whether or not he's going to take the Laker job. There's been a bunch of reports about him maybe making in upwards of $20 million of year, a year. I don't know how true that is. He's probably going to think about whether or not it's going to be anywhere. I think it's between 15 and 20. But for a guy that's coached back-to-back -back titles in college at UConn and how much more he could prove, I mean, maybe he wants to go for a three-peat, which hasn't been seen in forever. But maybe the dollars and the thoughts of living in Southern California is just going to be way too much for him to pass up on. So let's see what Danny Hurley's going to say as reports have it that he's expected to make a decision on the job, whether or not he's going to take it or leave it. So we'll monitor that as we go along. And then a sad note where Chet the Jet Walker 
passed away yesterday at the age of 84. The one-time Sixer was on that great 66-67 championship Philadelphia team with Wilt, Billy Cunningham, Hal Greer, also later on was traded. As a matter of fact, I think a year later to the Bulls where he played with Jerry Sloan, Bob Love, Norm Van Leer, and a seven-time All-Star, Chet Walker, a dynamic player there in the 60s and early 70s, dies at the age of 84. Thoughts, prayers, and condolences go out to the Walker family, the NBA, etc., as the passing of another great player, sadly. And he, 84, listen, I'd sign up for 84 right now, but we, know, we all know that we're going to have our day, and sadly for Chet Walker, his day has come. So that's what I have with the NBA. Now let me turn my attention as I lace up my skates and go onto the ice. And we had a game one there on Saturday night where the Oilers, I thought a, I don't want to say a heavy underdog, but certainly a solid favorite by the Panthers. And they had their opportunities. They had breakaways. They had plenty of them. About three off the top of my head. And big stops there by Sergei Bobrovsky. Turned away 32 shots. The Panthers got the scoring early in the first quarter period by Carter Verhage, and then they also had another goal in the second, topped that off with an empty netter there late in the third, and that was pretty much it. 3 nothing for the Panthers as they draw first blood in the series, and the Oilers, they have nothing to hang their heads over, certainly a better performance than what we saw in a win, game six against the Dallas Stars, where they only had 10 shots on goal and had just two shots in the final period. They did their best to pepper Bobrovsky with a bunch of shots and was turned away left and right and the Oilers were pretty much upbeat after the game saying that hey they did what they could tip your cap to Bobrovsky who let's face it Bobrovsky who's had a very good NHL career up for the Vezina Trophy this year and we've seen him in the past whether it was Columbus whether now here with the Panthers over the course of his career he's been a guy that has a lot of talent and is a very good goaltender, but for whatever the reason, when the money's on the line, the guy wilts. He was not a good goaltender when the spotlight was at his brightest, but for whatever the reason, between last postseason and this postseason, the guy has really stepped up. And now you'd have to even argue whether or not that he could be, when it's all said and done, a Conn Smythe Trophy winner for MVP of the playoffs. Now, I understand you have a bunch of other guys that could... Get that award where the name is Matthew Kachuk, even Verhage, a guy like Sam Bennett, maybe not Sam Reinhart, but you have other guys that I'm sure are going to be worthy of winning the Smythe Trophy. But if Bobrovsky continues, and not that he's going to be pitching shutouts left and right, but he is certainly on his way to becoming just that. And Edmonton, with the quick turnaround, obviously Saturday night to tonight, I think they need to win this game if they have any chance to win this series. And... I get it. People could say the same even in the Celtic Mavericks series that it's not really a series until the road team wins. And let's say if Edmonton does win, then obviously you'll have a series where they'll take the home ice away from the Florida Panthers. But even still, I think that with the win, Florida will probably win one of the next two in Edmonton if the Oilers do win tonight. That's how I look at it. And we all know the Oilers are very unpredictable. I talked about it, it seems like for weeks. Will the real Edmonton Oilers team please stand up? Going back to the Vancouver series, even to a certain extent, the King series in the opening round. But we don't know what to expect from this team. We would think that they're going to have hot pursuit on the goaltender there, Bobrovsky, and just try to do their best to get themselves even to go back to Edmonton. But one more time, even if they were to win tonight, I would still think Florida will get one of the next two in Edmonton. But... If they're going to win this series, they're going to have to win there tonight because even if they do win the two games in Edmonton, they still have to find a way to win a game in Florida, as we know, considering that the home ice does belong to Florida. But if Edmonton, one more time, I think that they have to win tonight. It's a must win for them. And they should look at it and take that approach because they'll have three days before game number three in Edmonton, which will be on Thursday night, and hoping that they could maybe draw first blood, take a lead, as we've seen. And they've blown leads, too, in the postseason. Now, mind you, they didn't get this far without having to go through a little bit of adversity. But, again, let's see if Edmonton comes fast out of the gate, maybe gets off to a couple-goal lead, and who knows whether they have to hang on for dear life, as we've seen time after time with this team, or if they go away and cruise to a 4-1 or 5-2 type win, 
That remains to be seen. I think Florida, I think they'll win the night. I think Florida will win the night. I said I picked them in five, and that's not a diss towards Edmonton, but even if they do win the night, I can see Florida winning the two games in Edmonton. That's how good they are, at least in my eyes. But we'll see what's going to happen there. I hope that for the hockey fan and even for the sports fan, I'm sure they don't want to have 2-0 Florida going to Edmonton, similar to what we see with Boston going to Dallas, because a lot of people are going to check out of these series. How I look at it is, is that if Dallas would have won or were to have won last night, I'm sure there would have piqued a lot of interest going into Wednesday's game to think that, oh, wait, maybe now Dallas, they could take over the series, go up 2-1 and make it a little bit interesting. But obviously that's not the case there. And I would think for tonight, if Edmonton loses, people are going to think, all right, I checked out because Florida's up 2-0. They're going to win the series. It's not as if if Edmonton does win, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to have to watch this game just to see whether or not Edmonton takes a 2-1 series lead and puts some pressure on the Panthers. Now, mind you, how many people are watching Panther hockey throughout the course of the regular season and even the casual sports fan throughout this postseason? Probably not many. And even though Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, and their star power, again, there are Edmonton north of the border. So not a lot of appeal to the average sports fan, whether or not they are following, whether minute by minute or tuning in every so often. But we shall see. I hope Edmonton does tie it up tonight. I am rooting for them to win this series and obviously bring a little intrigue and drama to Game 3 in Edmonton, unlike what's happening in the NBA Finals. So that's what we have there with the Stanley Cup, only one game to cover. So at that point, I'll be ready to pivot and put on my cleats and get into the batter's box to talk a little baseball. And one thing, I know I talked about this a lot dating back to last Monday and then obviously Thursday throughout the weekend on my channel YouTube where I discussed the first two games and then last night of course was the final game of the series between Dodgers and Yankees and here's where you know it's a big deal. I was in Manhattan on Saturday and in Midtown and I get it that it's touristy, there's going to be a zillion people from all over the place but I was shocked at how many Dodger jerseys, Dodger caps, Dodger hoodies, Dodger t-shirts, Otani, Betts, Freeman, going down the line. And I get it was a weekend. I'm sure there were a lot of people from the West Coast, from L.A. or maybe north of L.A., SoCal, who knows, maybe even Arizona or Dodger fans that just flocked into the city for the weekend to come see their beloved team and take a trip, take the four or the D train up to the Bronx to watch a potential World Series matchup. And I couldn't believe how many people were in the area. So for the Dodger fan, kudos to them for representing and showing up in the Bronx the way they did. And I wonder if they did the same the previous week when the Dodgers were at City Field for a weekday series. And mind you, they were here for the start of Memorial Day. So who knows? Maybe they came out and watched the first game. Who knows? But with all that being said, I made this series huge because it's very rare that the two teams get together. And I know with the change of the schedule going into last season where they're going to play every year but every other year in the stadium. So, for instance, obviously the Yankees played the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium last year, and then Yankee Stadium this year, and then obviously they'll be out in L.A. next year and flip-flop every year after that. But the way this series unfolded, it was certainly a playoff-like atmosphere throughout all three games. The opener was a pitcher's duel. Yamamoto giving up to him. Seven innings, two hits, two walks, struck out seven, I believe, in a dominant performance, but it went into extras before Teoscar Hernandez hit that double up the gap. And even though the Yankees tacked on the run in the bottom of the 11th, but the Dodgers hung on to win a thriller 2-1 there in game number one. And then Saturday night on Fox, where you had the Dodgers get out there to a, well, they got to a 4-2 lead. I know the Yankees drew first blood. And then the Dodgers, they're actually up 2-1, I should say. I got it backwards, then 3-2. Or they tied the game at two, and then the Dodgers took over to make it 4-2. And then they blew the game open late. Tosca Hernandez, another home run, or I should say two home runs in the game, hit a grand slam to open the game or bust it open for them. And the Dodgers went going away 11-3 there on Saturday. And then you had last night's game where the Dodgers, again, Tosca Hernandez was just... Killer to the Yankee side. Three homers, nine RBIs on the weekend. And then they had a 3-2 lead 
where Juan Soto did not play in the series. He had inflammation in his forearm. A lot of people thought it could have been worse. Maybe Tommy John in his left arm or his throwing hand. And for Soto to not be a part, which took a little bit away from the series because it would have been great to see Soto go up against the Dodgers and have the Yankee squad at full health. But that wasn't the case. You had Trent Grisham play. And when Grisham came to bat, when the Yankees had first and third, nobody out after Giancarlo Stanton struck out. And with Grisham up, the fans, the Yankee fans were chanting, we want Soto. And then what happened? The we want Soto became a shot over the right field wall to where Grisham made the game 3-2 to 5-3 over Tyler Glasnow. And Glasnow got the loss, struck out 12, did pitch well, but gave up that big mistake in, at an inopportune time. And 5-3 then became 5-4, and then Judge iced it off with a home run there in the 8th, his 24th home run, which also had a home run there the night before in the second game of the series. And the Yankees were able to hang on there because the Dodgers bound the comeback there, had first and third, with I believe first and second, with two outs. And Mookie Betts at the plate with Clay Holmes on the mound looking to slam the door, and he did so by striking out Mookie Betts to close the game, and the Yankees salvaged their series against the Dodgers, and I love it. It was great to have that atmosphere, especially in New York. You hadn't seen the Dodgers grace Yankee Stadium since 2016, and of course, we'll get to see them two years from now, but when you have those two teams go at it, and all the nostalgia, the history between the two dating back to the days of Brooklyn, and I talked about that on Thursday's podcast, and not only that, the regular season, I get it. It's a formality. You just want to get to October, but you got to have some juice. It's not like the NBA or NHL where a team comes to town for one game, whether it's the Lakers going to Boston to play the Celtics or a team that may be hot that one year and they come to town for the one time. A lot of people don't look at that as a game or something that you have to gravitate to the television set to watch and say, oh, I have to lock in and zero in on this particular game in the NBA or NHL. Kind of gets forgotten. And I get it, baseball is the same way. But because it's three games and because you get a nice litmus test or barometer as to where the two teams stack up, and for baseball, that needs all the attention that it could get. And when you have a big series like that, and the Yankees are going to have a bunch of big series upcoming, and especially an interleague series like that, because you have the Orioles coming to Yankee Stadium next week, which is going to be a huge series i believe it's tuesday wednesday thursday next week and in the following series you have the braves coming in and i get it no ronald acuna jr but you have the braves coming in the yankee stadium so that's a series that people will pay attention to and that's why with the three game series baseball you want to focus in on and see where these teams stack up against one another and especially when it has two teams that could be playing against each other for a world series so that's why I made it a big deal, and that's why I started off the baseball segment with that. You also had another big series, the London series, where the Mets were able to split and got out of Dodge with a win there yesterday after losing 7-2 there on Saturday. The Bryce Harper slide, the soccer slide after hitting a home run, and the Mets were able to save some face. The game was tied at 3-3. They were down 5-3. They came all the way back, and then with a rally there in the ninth inning, where you had that tapper in front of the mound, where Luis Torrens made that great play, where he was able to step on the plate. It was bases loaded with one out. It got the double play to end the game, and the Yankees were able to get, or excuse me, the Mets. The reason why I say Yankees on my brain is because, and I'll get to that in a second. You get one of the two games there in London, and Michael Kay, of all people, was the play-by-play -play guy, and everybody knows. And again, it's not, I don't want to say it's the Yankee hate or whatever, but Michael Kay is not a good play-by-play -play guy. I'm sorry, and I'm not going to go any further than that. But have to, having to listen to him call the game and close out the game the way he did, at least the Mets won, and now come home after a day off today, they'll have the Marlins come in, and let's see if they could continue to go along here in this Major League season, which I know Steve Cohen had made some words talking about the Mets and talking about the next seven weeks between now and the deadline. I'm not going to get into that. To me, this season is going to be lost. I get it that they're, what, four or five games back in the wild card. I don't even know. I don't even pay attention because, to me, get to 500 first before I can even think about the Mets being in a playoff scenario. And I don't care if the sixth seed in the NL, whomever that may be, because I haven't even followed the wild card, I don't care if they're a game on the 500. 
The Mets have to get to 500 first. This isn't the NBA where you can make it into the postseason at 36 and 46. They're going to have to at least get to, you would think when it's all said and done, 81 and 81. And between now and the end of the season, we still have four months to go, maybe a little bit less than that. So I am not even thinking about the postseason until the Mets get to 500. And I don't care if they're a game back and they're two games under 500 where the team ahead of them is right at 500. No, get me the fire in the first before I can take this Met team seriously. And whatever Steve Cohen or David Stearns or Carlos Mendoza, whatever it is they have, have to say about the organization and their chances and the trade deadline and what they're thinking about doing, and I don't want to hear it. Let me focus in on them getting at least to an even record and then maybe, well, I can't say maybe, then I'll unpack where the Mets are at that time. But right now, sorry, I can't get into that. And I also didn't talk about Garrett Cole. I know his rehab the other day. He probably had another start yesterday. If not, he probably has one today because he did throw three and a thirds for the Somerset Patriots, the double-A team of the Yankees, where three and a third, and I know this is five days late, people, or even six days, and he probably had a, another game yesterday where every five days, and you would think that he's probably going to have a couple of more, maybe three more warm-up starts before he gets back into the big leagues, which you're probably looking at right now, the end of June. And I'm sure that will be a good tune-up as he gets to the All-Star break. So good news there for Cole. Let's see what's going to happen with him as we get deeper into this month. And of course, with the Yankee rotation being stellar as it is, boy, that is going to be a huge shot in the arm, no pun intended, once Cole gets back. And then you have the Royals overcoming that big deficit, winning two out of three and against the Mariners. They were down 8-0, and they came all the way back with a walk-off there in the ninth. They were down 9-7. They scored three. Bobby Wood Jr. tied the game and then got the game-winning hit there to put the Royals in the victory. They did lose yesterday, and you have an interesting series to start off the week and a four-gamer at that where the Yankees will go to, to Kansas City. Now, this is more of a bigger test for Kansas City than it is for the Yankees as we know, and you may see Juan Soto in the lineup as early as tonight, so we'll definitely keep an eye on that. So that's one where the Royals, we're going to see where they stack up against the Big Bad Yankees, and I'm looking forward to that. Tonight, you actually have Carlos Rodon against Seth Lugo, who has been by far one of the top two or three pitchers in the American League this year as a starter, so let's see how he fares against the Bombers. And... Also, other news and notes, the Braves lose three out of four to the Nationals. What's going on there? They won their first game on Thursday night before losing the back three of that series. And no run on the Cunha Jr., as I mentioned. So the Braves scuffling a bit this year, although they're going to be in the top six when it comes to them being a part of the postseason. I'd be shocked if they don't, but you would think they're going to be in good stead when it's all said and done. But as far as the schedule for this week, Yankees-Royals four games starting tonight. You also have Baltimore and Tampa as they round out their series today. They have a wraparound series where the Orioles have beaten them the first three games and the Rays are now at the bottom of the AL East. So you know they were due to have a bad year. So let's see if the Orioles could put the Rays out into the Gulf of Mexico over the course of this stretch here. And the Orioles will then come home after the game today and they'll have the Braves starting tomorrow in Baltimore, the first of three. So that's one to keep an eye on. You also have the Philadelphia Phillies going to Boston to play the Red Sox. And then the Red Sox will play the Yankees. They'll host them this weekend for three games for the first time this year. So we'll keep an eye on that. Deeper into the week, what else you have? Not a lot really cooking. Am I going to get geeked up about Houston at San Francisco? The defending champs going to play the Dodgers starting tomorrow. The Battle of Ohio, Cleveland at Cincinnati. Chicago at Tampa. Excuse me. Not a lot there on the docket. To me, Atlanta, Baltimore, very good series. Baltimore hosting the Braves. That's one to keep an eye on. Besides that, there isn't much. Philadelphia, Boston, you want to look at that series as one to keep an eye on. Absolutely. And as we look at the standings, what I have here... Orioles, again, just a game behind the Yankees. I know two and a half on the loss when you look at the standings, but remember, the Orioles have three games in hand, and next week, as I mentioned, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, huge series between the Orioles and Yankees, which you know is going to be enormous. Then you have Red Sox at 500, 
And then Blue Jays raised round out there. Guardians continue to play well. Still have that four-game lead. Five and a loss over the Royals. So the Royals, who knows? Maybe if the Guardians have a big week against the Reds, they're not only going to play the two-game series against the Reds in Cincinnati, but if the Royals, for whatever reason, go belly up and lose three out of four, they're going to lose some ground there to the Guardians. So we'll keep an eye on that. Seattle has a five-game lead with four and a loss over the Rangers. So we'll continue to monitor what's happening there in the AL West. AL, Phillies, Braves, nine-game lead, eight in the loss. So, yeah, they almost kind of bounce out there with the schedule as the Braves have two games in hand against the Phillies. And that also helped, too, because, remember, the Phillies did not play since last Wednesday with the two games in London. So they made up a couple of games there. And now think about that. There are eight in the loss and nine back of the Phillies in the NL East. Reds, Brewers, Brewers have a seven-game lead in the loss column, six and a half in the division, and then the Dodgers are going to be going away with that. They have nine in the loss and eight back in the division. And let's talk about the over-unders real quick. I know I talked about that on Thursday's podcast, and let me tell you something. It looks like it's going to be very average at best. Your over-unders are as follows. As I pull those up, where are they? The wins that I have here, three wins and or three overs, three unders, I should say. I have no wins as of yet. But what's looking good, Baltimore, 89 and a half. All right, that's looking fine. Kansas City, 73 and a half. Think about that. I picked them as an over, and they're currently at, what, 42 at the present moment. So for those two teams, they look like wins. As far as my unders, the one win that looks pretty good right now, and it could be borderline, is Colorado. They have 23, the number's 59 and a half. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm picked on them for whatever the reason. So, that's looking pretty good. Now, the losses that are looking really bad. And I thought Arizona as 83 and a half is an over. Now, who knows? They're at 31 right now, and that is looking putrid. I thought that they would piggyback off of the year they had last year. Not to say that they're going to win 90, but maybe they would win upper 80s. That is certainly not looking good by any stretch. Then you have... The losses, I picked two division winners at the present moment, or division leaders. Minnesota, uh, Milwaukee, which they're at 38 right now, and they were 79 and a half. They're going to blow that by leaps and bounds. And then I also had the Guardians with a new manager, Stephen Vogt, on top of them losing Shane Bieber, not having a big offense, but they have performed well above I've ever thought and imagined. Cleveland 79 and a half. And in fact, I got that mixed. Milwaukee 76 and a half. And they're right at the number. They're just halfway there to that number at 38. And Cleveland 79 and a half. And they're at 42. So they're well past the halfway part to even get to that number. So right now I'm looking at three and three. Could be two and four, depending on what Colorado does. So ugh, we'll look at those ghastly numbers maybe by the time we get to the trade deadline and we'll pick it up at that point. That's what I have with baseball. Now to wrap it up, we'll go rapid fire. Nothing much happening in the NFL, but I'll get on the clay surface, get my tennis racket, and cap off a French Open, which when you look at a guy like Carlos Alcaraz, he won his third major, first ever French Open on the surface that is idle. Rafael Nadal had won 14 times, and he earned this one because he had to come from behind in the semifinal against Yannick Sinner. Was on the ropes there a little bit. Not an epic or a classic semifinal between he and Sinner, who is the number one player in the world. And I'll get to that in a moment. But for Alcaraz to come from behind, down two sets to one, to win the last two sets to get himself propelled to a final where he beat Alexander Zverev, was also down two sets to one. I believe it was what? He was down, won the first set 6-3. Then it was, I believe, 2 6 5 7 before capping off the tournament in pretty much easy fashion. 6-1, 6-2. So whatever it was, he got a boost there in the final two sets and just overpowered Zverev there. And even Zverev, Zverev had to tip his cap and just say how wonderful that Alcaraz was, not only here, but his future, 21 years of age, already three Grand Slams in his back pocket. And it's just the Australian away from winning a career Grand Slam. He's going to have to wait till January in order to attain that. But for right now, Alcaraz is flying and is in good shape as Wimbledon is just now, what, three weeks from yesterday, I believe? 
So you have that on the horizon for him. And by far, a guy that arguably could be the number one, but based on the rankings and the tennis points, and because he was ahead, Yannick Sinner, that is, of Alcaraz, he's automatically going to be number one because of Djokovic having to withdraw with the knee issue that he had. And who knows what's going to be his status there for Wimbledon. And he's going to want to get himself primed and ready for the Olympics because he missed out on getting a gold there in the 21 Olympics based on the pandemic. So I don't know what the priority is. Obviously for him, it's going to be health, Djokovic that is. But whether he makes it for Wimbledon, that may be a bit of a stretch. But you know he's going to be set to go up in the Olympics. That's in the latter part of July. So I digress there. But for Alcaraz... Although not number one in the world, he's probably number two. But if he does go out and wins in Wimbledon, which he won two years ago, then he will be inarguably the number one player in the world. And you could even argue whether or not he's number one based on him beating Sinner and him winning the tournament. I could see if he beat Sinner and lost Wimbledon where it's like, all right, well, he did beat him, but Sinner still would rank number one. But again, point system, ranking, etc., Automatically goes to center, but Alcaraz is nipping at his heels, and let's see if he could overtake him by the time we get to the All England Club there the 1st of July and beyond. And then on the women's side, no contest. Iga Shiantek completes the three-peat, three straight French Opens for the last five. She disposed of Coco Goff, as we talked about it on the podcast day of Thursday. She's 11-1 lifetime against Coco Goff. It just goes to show you how dominant she's been against her. But she went up against the young Italian, what's her name? Jasmine Paulini and beat her in straight sets in 68 minutes. 6-2, 6-1. What more can I say about Shiantek? But now she has to piggyback this. As great as she's been on that surface. And there is no if ands, buts. She's the number one women's player in the world. No argument there. And for her now as to get to Wimbledon. And that's not really her surface. She has not won Wimbledon. I believe she's made it to a semifinal, maybe even a final off the top of my head. I have to really think about that. But now Shiantek, we know she's great on the clay. We know that she's been just leaps and bounds or head and shoulders above everybody else. But now let's see you back this up, go to Wimbledon and win there come the middle of July. And I'm not trying to diminish what she's done at the French, but... We need to see a little bit more from her. And now she's won five Grand Slams overall, but four on the surface. I believe the other one was the U.S. Open two years ago. May have been the Australian. Again, got to do my homework, people. My apologies. But I know for sure she's only won five Grand Slams. And when four is on one surface and not many on the others, yes, you are a great player. You're on number one. Understood. But we want to see a little bit more balance. We want to see her go out and attack Wimbledon. We want to see her go out and win a U.S. Open or win an Australian. So it's right in front of her. Let's see you win, which is in essence the Super Bowl of tennis. And that we still have plenty of time to chew on. But for right now, give it up to Shiantek. She does win her third straight and four of the last five. And congratulations to her. So that's what I got there with the tennis. As I move it along to Belmont, what is there to discuss? You had an interesting race down the stretch where it looked like it was going to be Sierra Leone who was the favorite, and you also had Mystic Dan and Seas the Grey, and Seas the Grey was in the mix early on. But when it was all said and done, you had Doorknock and Mindframe come neck and neck down the stretch, where Doorknock, who is owned or part owner, one of the owners, by former Major League Baseball player Jason Wirth, World Series champion 08, played for the Dodgers, bounced around there a little bit, Nationals later on. He was a champion, when you think about it, but this time in the horse racing realm, as he won by a length and a half over mind frame, Caesar Gray and Mystic Dan were up the track. I think Caesar Gray may have been the third, but with the race not being at the Belmont because of renovations and up at Saratoga, I don't know if it had the same feel. I didn't really watch it. I did watch the replay, though. And yes, Doorknock and mind frame, Doorknock pretty much led from the start, and Caesar Gray got off to a good start, but certainly did not duplicate what he did at the Preakness and certainly Mystic Dan was nowhere to be found so your horse racing season ends there I understand you may have the Breeders Cup later on the year but does not have the same panache or even the feel based on the three races that we've experienced from the run of the roses there the first Saturday in May two weeks after that down in Pimlico and then now with the Belmont put to rest which pretty much also 
caps off the horse racing season in my eyes when you have that. And then lastly, I think I have one more thing to say here. Lastly, Scotty Scheffler. I bring him up because the memorial, which took place over the weekend in Dublin, that's Jack Nicholson's tournament. And for Scotty Scheffler, the win, that's his fifth one this year. And mind you, it's not a major tournament. And you know me, I don't follow majors. But with what happened there at the PGA, we all know him getting arrested. And I know they just showed recently a body cam of one of the police officers of him already in handcuffs. And when they brought that up, I said, why even bother? Who cares? Why is that even an issue or even a story? If anything, we wanted to see the body cam of the officer that was alleged dragged from the car and got scrapes and bumps and some bruises. For whatever reason, I don't even think that officer had a body cam on him. And if he did, it wasn't even turned on because that was the one that we really wanted to see. But I digress. But for Scheffler to go through what happened there that Friday, getting arrested, shot well that day, Saturday not so well, and then cap it off with a very good final round. And for Scheffler to win the Memorial and with five wins already in his back pocket, including a Masters, now you would think, is he going to be the favorite come Thursday at the Pinehurst Club down in North Carolina where the U.S. Open will commence? And that's going to be a big story heading into the tournament Thursday. You know I'll talk about it, give you a prediction, get into the ins and outs, see what the weather will be like. As obviously it's going to get warm here, especially in the Northeast as temperatures are going to hit close to 90, if not at 90. So you would think if it's going to be 90 here in the Northeast, you can only imagine what it's going to be like in North Carolina. It's probably going to be mid-90s or above. And with the heat index, who knows? So Scheffler, who is on a roll here, even after that little hiccup there at the PGA, Let's see if he's going to capture another major tournament to go along with the Masters that he had there at Augusta two months prior. So that's what I have there. Anything else that's happening in sports, you know I got you covered. But for right now, that is it. That will do it. Another episode just about in the books. Thank you so much for stopping by, for carving out precious time out of your day to listen to what it is I have to say about what goes on in the world of sports. If you haven't done so, please subscribe, rate, review on YouTube at JReal. Subscribe to that channel. Let's increase those subscribers there people check out the new vlog as i mentioned at the top i am new media that's the title and i go in you definitely don't want to miss that if you haven't subscribed to apple spotify or gone to the website jreels.com please do so as well and also if you want to hit me up with a question comment suggestion you can do so at the following not only on youtube at jreels but also instagram tiktok facebook the jreels podcast twitter x jreels one just the number the old-fashioned way, the JRills Podcast at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys and gals because whether you do or do not know, this is what I love to do, people. Full-time content creator. As you know, four months in, trying to blaze a trail, blaze a path. I got a podcast coming up, as I mentioned at the top. Casey Standahar from Fox Sports, ESPN, Sideline Reporter. Great conversation there. You won't want to miss that. Not only on Apple, Spotify, but also on my YouTube channel. Another podcast coming on Thursday. Coming at you always with nothing but fire, passion, fury, energy with my thoughts, opinions, critiques, praise, analysis, feelings on anything and everything that happens on the world of the diamond, ice, gridiron, hardwood, golf course, racetrack, tennis court, boxing ring, octagon, you name it. From my lips to your ears, from my heart to your soul, from where I am to wherever you are, the J Reels Podcast always comes correct, direct, and in full effect. From the South Bronx to South Beach to South Center to the South Pacific and all points beyond, peace, love, and God bless everybody. And until next time on the J Reels Podcast, on the flip, baby.